This is a Pinball News production. So thank you all for coming. Uh, there's, I think, plenty of pizza left for later, because we can't have them up in the stand, so we know our rules now. Uh, so my name is Joe Balser with American Pinball. Uh, my career started a long time ago, like 1982. So I've been hanging around this industry for about 36 years. And I look back at the numbers today and thought, wow, that's it was only yesterday when this thing started for me, but here we are. Um, so we're going to open this thing up with a, a, a joke. We're going to try to get people laughing here a little bit. So uh, Houdini and Chris Angel walk into a bakery, and uh, Chris Angel says, watch this, Houdini. And he swipes three donuts and he puts them in his pocket and nobody sees it. He said, that was a pretty good trick, wasn't it? And Houdini looks back at him and says, yeah, that was all right, but uh, all right, it's good enough for now. And he walks up to the owner and says, hey, can I get a donut? So Houdini gets a donut, eats it right in front of the owner of the donut shop. Says, hey, can I get another one? And uh, he grabs another donut, eats it right on the spot, and uh, asks for a third donut. And uh, the, the owner of the donut shop's looking at him sideways, and what's going on here? And he devours the third donut, and uh, and looks at him and says, "What you know? What are you doing? You just had three donuts. What are you doing? What's the trick?" And uh, you know, there's supposed to be a trick here. He said, "Well, go check Chris Angel's pocket." Yeah. So I probably didn't come off too good on that one, but at least it's something with me involved. I don't know. Yeah, found it on the found it on the web. So there we go. So anyway. Um, You know, pinball for me has just been just a part of what I've been hooked into for many years. Uh, I was basically in the industry for, for the longest time and then was out of it for about three years. Uh, and in those three years' time, I really wanted to get back in it. And had an opportunity with American Pinball as, as a startup. Um, so I jumped at that and uh, we created this guy. Um, we did this in, in kind of a record time. Um, it was a piece of paper in November of 2016. And I was able to put together a, a team of guys that I knew could pull this thing off. And the big surprise to them was that we were going to do take this piece of paper and we were going to create this pinball machine and we were going to bring it to Texas in March. And they said, okay, March 2018. And I said, no, March in four months. And uh, they all looked at me sideways and there was a few expletives used at the time. We got kids here, so we won't bother going there. But uh, the impossibility of it, or, or the thought of it being impossible to make it happen, was not on the table. And we had some really dedicated people that just said, you know what, you think you can do this? I think we can do this. And we got these guys to buy in. And it wasn't just the team creating the game. It was several vendors that I had worked with in the past that just wanted to lift us up and make it happen. And uh, two weeks before Texas, it was about two weeks, was the first time we saw the catapult work. Now, people that are familiar with the game, we've got this catapult shot that travels about 22 inches. And if that didn't work, there wasn't a plan B. Usually try to have a plan B, I don't have one. Um, the guys were there, we were there daily for 14, 16 hour days. We were putting in all kinds of ridiculous hours to make this happen. And 
I had left at about midnight or so one night when we finally got this thing up and running, but we didn't have it wired right, something was not right, so I left to go get some shut eye and it wasn't 15 minutes later that <clears throat> I got a, a, a text with a, a, a movie attached to it and you know, popped that on and saw this thing fire. Well, the thing was, it was hitting the ramp and bouncing against the wall and it didn't even make it. And immediately I just put my shoes back on and jumped in the car, went back to the, to the office and started playing with it. We ended up having to trim the ramp a little bit. We did a couple things to it. We messed with the uh, pulse on it. And the first one that that thing hit, it was high-fiving and jumping up and down and I still get a little tingle up the back thinking about it because if it didn't work we were in big trouble because it was only a couple of weeks to the show so we started pounding hours into it again right after that and we're able to clean this thing up and make it work and we were seeing it working about 90 percent of the time so we were in a pretty good place with it um, I could have played it safe um, you know a lot of pinball designs out there, you do want to stay on the safe side. You don't want to kind of cross too many lines where a shot won't work or have issues with it. Um, you know, we could easily put a wire form in front of that catapult and let it throw, you know, kind of like the back catapult, and let it throw into a wire form and get to the box, but it's just a lot cooler without it. Um, there, you know, occasionally you're going to find it's a pinball machine. There's there's mechs that work perfect most of the time, and then there's mechs that kind of are a fake. And uh, you know, it when you dial it in and you get it right, um, it works well. So we put a bunch, you know, we put adjustments in it to make it happen, and then that became basically the feature shot of the game. Uh, I thought it was going to be the stage mech, but it turned out to be that uh, that shot. So. Making it to Texas was a big deal, and there was some, um, there was a little bit of baggage that the company was holding on to for some prior stuff that was going on, and we really needed to make that jump and make that happen for Texas. And when we did, we were able to kind of put a splash out there for the company that we were, we were real. We brought a couple of real games to the show. The art was there, sounds were there, the game had some coding in it, and uh, and we started. API basically was reborn at the Texas show in 2017. And that kind of brings us to where we are today. Um, like I said earlier, I was going to have to probably jump it around a little bit, but like I said earlier, my career started back in 82. Uh, I was working as a mechanic at a gas station when gas stations used to have mechanics and full serve and all that back in the day. And I uh, kept getting laid off and called back from General Motors as a kid, but I was working for GM um, as a setup man, machine setup man, over at Electromotive. It was a, a train division. They were making locomotives there. It was a pretty wild job. 10,000 employees working three shifts a day, seven days a week. It was amazing. But um, I was working on a guy's car, uh, Tony. An older Italian guy that I knew, and he, I was the only one he would let work on the car, so we got to be close. And he says, "Hey, I got a, my nephew's got a got an opening for because uh, I, I like model making, tool maker type of thing. So why don't you go down and see my nephew?" He's like, "Okay." So I go down. There's this big white building on, off of Mannheim uh, in, in uh, Franklin Park, and I walk into this big place, and there's a uh, Pac-Man out front. Look, 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 I'm going in. It's and it's Midway Manufacturing, and I wasn't even a video guy then. I, I really never really got into video games much when I was a kid either. Uh, it's back when I used to kids used to go out a lot and just play and you know in sports and everything else. We weren't tied into video games a lot. And I didn't go to arcades to play video games very often. So I walked in and I. You guys remember those old boards? There's a black board with the white lettering on it that you just slide letters up and on, and it said, you know, Midway Manufacturing welcomes Joe Walser, and it's this gigantic vestibule. Uh, I'm a kid, 23 years old, and I walked up to this little desk in this big area and said, that's me, and uh, it all started there. I got a job in, as a model maker in the tool room at 
at, at Midway, and then Valley bought them as Valley Midway. Um, started to get into pinball a little bit, doing fixtures. So I was a line fixture guy, where they used to call it, it was kind of a, a, a prick punch plates that you drop the play field in, and every spotted hole on the game, it gets pressed into the board, released, it's nice to make the fixtures for that. And then a lot of line fixtures and keep it, you know, uh, kind of on the production side. So I did a lot of machining, a lot of work in the tool room, actually making making dies and uh, making fixtures. And then, uh, you know, the first game I laid, not laid out, but actually laid it out for the spotting templates was a, a little mini pin called Granny and the Gators. And I don't know how many people even have seen that or heard of it, but they did, it was a little mini play field with a monitor on it, so it was a video pin. And that's the first game I kind of worked on, um, moving over to the pinball side for fixtures. Everything else was line fixtures for assemblies. Um, Eight Ball Deluxe was on the line. And there were stacks of, to the ceiling of monitors everywhere because they were running Pac-Man. And I mean, there were, you know, the 36 inch wide aisles just for OSHA at the time. And that's the only aisles you had to get through and every place in there with these stacks of monitors everywhere you looked because they were moving thousands of, of, uh, of Pac-Man at the time. So that's where it all started for me. Um, ended up getting laid off from there when uh, Valley did a big layoff across the board and moved over to uh, a company called Wicko. And we did a game there called Aftor. It was made one, it was a one and done company banks came in one day and everybody cleared out. Um, never got to game two. I didn't play the game out again. I was doing fixtures at the time. So uh, once that ended, um, I ended up at Premier Technology and still in the tool room, but starting to learn AutoCAD uh, just on my own time, uh, kind of figure it out, working with the guys. Uh, that the games what we were producing, I was doing all the fixturing for the, those games also. And then in time, Premier closed. So once I left Premier, then I had an opportunity to go over to Data East. They brought me to Data East, I was working with Joe Camico, Gary Stern, um, at the early days. They had, uh, what was on the line? I think oh, the first Simpsons, their first Simpsons was on the line when I got there. So Joe gave me an opportunity to get into engineering. So I moved into engineering and then still was doing um, work with getting the plates made, kind of overseeing some stuff from between engineering and production. And um, you know, I was able to really get a lot of insight and a lot of direction um, on the game design side. Started to see how it really comes together and you start getting an eye for how the games lay out. So, I had an opportunity then, and the first game that I was able to lay out, my own layout, um, was Baywatch. So back then, you kind of had an open book on how you wanted to do things, and Baywatch is a really loaded game, a lot of rampage. I was able to really get a little crazy with wire ramps and, and you know, get the ball off the play field. And the game did you know, fairly well for us. Um, and I had a blast doing it, you know. At the time, we'd go and visit the whole Baywatch crew and everything out in California. Um, and there was a lot of tie-ins where you'd be a lot more involved, um, I think, than even today. You were more involved with the people that own the license as opposed to now it's more formal paperwork back and forth and you get, you submit, and you get approved, you submit, you get disapproved, whatever it is. Um, but, Back then, there was, there was more of a relationship with, with the people that had the license. Um, so, it all started there as far as layouts went for me. And then, as time went on, you know, some of the games I did there was, uh, like Apollo 13 was probably my favorite game that I did there. Uh, you know, I came up with the idea of 13 ball, multi ball. So, if anyone hasn't shot an Apollo, or if you run into an Apollo and you can shoot it, uh, when it dumps eight balls on top of five that are already on the play field, uh, you know, the first time we had it on test, the woman was playing it with her son, and 
we had it set up, so all she had to do was make one shot into the Saturn V rocket, and she was going to go right to 13 ball multi ball. And she screamed where her kids started crying, uh, thinking that something just happened to her mom or to their mom. But um, it was just that that we've never seen it before kind of thing on a pinball. And when all those balls drop, you know, you can see the excitement. And anytime we went out on a test and watching people play, and even to this day, I have one at home. I was lucky enough to have one at home. And I was able to go to uh, Jim Lovell's house and deliver it. And he signed the game. He signed the Saturn Five rocket for us uh, on the original game that I had. And, you know, it was just that kind of experience level that really had me hooked. And from that point on, I was like, this is too much fun to get away from. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not an industry that's that's gigantic. I mean, even though back in the day, back in the 90s, uh, you know, there were a couple, you know, there was 100,000 pinball games made a year between five companies. So it was a different, there was a different industry then. It was definitely a bigger industry. And we've seen its ups and downs, you know, and we're seeing this thing climbing back up to a decent level for, for this industry. And obviously we want to see it grow more. Um, you know, at, at Stern, uh, I was I worked with you know worked for Gary for like 13 years, so I got to see a lot. I got to be involved in a lot of games. Um, if I wasn't laying out a game, I was helping you know John Board or whoever it might be on the mechanics of a game. Um, I, I learned over years to able to do a complete game, so I could. You know, I, I've had, you know, seen enough and, and been around enough where I could do the mechanisms, I could do the layout. There's a, there's a few games out there that I did everything on them um, as, as the game went to production. And then there's other games where you get, you know, this guy will take this mech, this guy will take this mech. And it, we kind of bounce, bounce that back and forth between us when we were doing games. Because we were more of a, we had one decent sized team that did three models a year, as opposed to like the big guys over at uh, WMS and Waves at the time, you know, had three or four teams doing three or four games a year. So each team would do a game a year, is how it turned out, where we were doing three games a year with that one team. So you always had one in the works, but it wasn't where you had uh, separate team members working on separate games. We all kind of group together and did our own thing that way. It's right now, it's kind of the way things are set up um, at American Pinball. Um, you know, the company's still young. Um, one game in the market, uh, one game coming up. We may do a little something for that second game today. You guys might get a little sneak on it, we'll see. Uh, kind of on the edge of doing that or not. It's uh, hard to start to reveal things on a game. <coughs> When it's, you know, I can't show it to you. I don't want to be that guy that, you know, here's a, you know, here's a back glass and here's a side art for a cabinet and then the game's not for a year down the road or whatever. So I'm not that kind of guy. I want to kind of, we want to put things out there when it's appropriate to do. And we're close enough that I think it's appropriate today to kind of talk about a little bit about what we're doing for game two, which we're going to try to get to Expo in Chicago in October. So we're out of our minds um, trying to get this thing going. Yeah, I promised Tommy to come out here. He asked, he asked me to come out here. And, you know, you can't change plans, but that's how it always works. You you finally get in a lot of things, but then you have something that you have to get to. And I'm glad, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's a nice little break for me anyway. Just to kind of, you know, touch base with everybody again. And, just kind of get that fire going again, which is what these shows do for for manufacturers. Um, to see you guys and, and uh, you know the support that you guys make for this industry, it's amazing, and it's all over the states. So it's the first time I'm up in Canada, so we know that it's you know it's here and it's here to stay. I don't see this thing going anywhere at, at any time. So you know it, it's made it through its big ups and downs and. And we're in a good place. The industry's in a, in a good place, and you know we can all be happy about that. That we kept it kept it going this long. So, um, 
And American Pinball, like I said, we, we're small and we need to grow. Um, you know, I'm always looking for good people to bring on, uh, on what we do there. So anybody here knows mechanical, electrical guys, um, artists, people that sound people, you know, that are interested in pinball that could help us, um, feel free to, I got a bunch of cards up here, um, email me, call us. You know, we're looking for good people to make this thing grow. So that's another little pitch that I wanted to put out there. Is, you know, we're, we're constantly open to finding um, quality people to bring on board to make this thing start to grow. And that's kind of where we're at now. Um, Houdini, when I got there, was a title that the company had. Uh, they trademarked it. And there was another layout that was out there um, that just didn't work. And that's where that piece of paper came from in November of 2016. I was hired in October of 2016. Uh, actually brought in um, as a director of operations, basically for a company that didn't have a product and no operations. So it was something that had to be done where we, we had a product to move forward with. And, you know, we got lucky um, on this layout. You know, I tried to put as much time in it, you know, as I was laying it out, so there weren't a lot of mistakes made, or a lot of, you know, you oversee, so you, you don't see something like you should. Um, our vendors were spot on to, if they saw issues with drawings that were out there, they'd be on the phone right away, look, I, I think you meant to do this, or <clears throat> there's something missing here, or whatever. And it all kind of came together, and to this day, I don't even know how, because it, it's hard, pinball's hard enough, but to go, like I said, to go from that, you know, sketch to pretty much what you see here in that four-month window was, a, was an amazing thing. And, and, Personally, I wanted that to happen. I, I just, there's, there's been a few years now, you know, over the last five years plus, that, you know, games take a long time to get to market, or, you know, a new product comes out, and, and then it just doesn't get to the end, the, 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 the customer base, in any type of a time frame. And, you know, in my heart of hearts, I knew that with the right people on it, and you just let us do our job, and everybody takes responsibility for that part of it, that it could be done. And it took a little buying into by everybody because of that short window. But once everybody kind of shook on it and said, let's make this happen, it was, it just started to roll. And, you know, I had vendors showing up at eight, nine, ten o'clock at night me, look, I got those parts for you. Are you still there? Or can I drop them off at your house? What do you want me to do? And really, these guys were showing up in, you know, late nights, uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, um, enthusiastic about getting those parts to us to, to be a part of what we were trying to do. That was amazing. That was something that I'll never forget. Some of these guys, I still, to this day, I, I thank them, even for what they did back then. Um, to get us to where we needed to be then, and now they're stepping up to get us to where we need to be now. So, um, it's kind of a fun thing. It's a small little industry, it's kind of like a grain of you know sand on this beach of industries, and there's pinball. And so you get to know a lot of people, and you get to you get some friendships that last for a long time. Um, you know, I'm talking to guys that has been 25 years since I've talked to them, and somehow 25 years goes by like that. I don't get it. But, um, you know, even talking about starting in this industry in 1982, wow, I mean, that's, that's a lifetime ago. And I'm, I'm amazed that it's still going, and, you know, these people are still doing it. And it's, it just, 
it knocks me out on, on a small, a small, tiny industry like this that there's so much enthusiasm that just keeps it rolling. You know, <coughs> people like Tommy that is so enthusiastic and so passionate about what he does, and you know, he's not the only one. There's distributors across the states that we use around the, the planet that we use um, that have that same burn in them to make this thing work, and that's how that's how it works. It, it's not. I, I'm not, I'm a, I, I do pinball design, but that's where it stops. I mean, I can do the lines and circles and make it work from a bird's eye view looking down. I can do mechanisms if and when I need to, but that's the beginning. You know, what I do is the, the start of it all. And then all these other people have to be a part of it to create that. So that's not, I didn't do the art. I didn't do the sounds, I didn't program the game, I didn't do any of the illustrations that are, and I had none of it. I, you know, that's not what I do. So, it kind of starts with the design, and then everybody buys into what you're doing. You kind of tweak it a little bit. Hopefully that, you know, shots will work when you get all the flat rails and ball guides in, and the shots that you see on the computer are the shots that work in real life, in real time. And, that's the luck. That's the luck part, I guess. Is you know a part of this thing is you know flat rails and ball guides on this game didn't change. Um, there are there's not a rev box. I mean, rev A B C D E F and G. And there's a lot of a lot of stuff on this game is the same from that first initial release to get the samples made. So that's something that had to happen to make it. You know, to make the game in, in that short of time. So you had to have a lot of confidence in what you were putting out there and have a lot of confidence in your vendors that they were going to get what you needed to you in a short amount of time. And it all paid off in the end. Uh, it, was, it was awesome to do the unveiling of, of the game in Texas. Um, everybody running up to the game to see this for the first time was just, uh, you know, great experience. You can't, you can't put words to it when you see that amount of enthusiasm coming from a customer base. And, you know, we just, one of the things we try to do early on is to try to be that more of a friendly company to our distributors and a friendly company to our customers. We're open to, you know, sit down and talk with anyone here at any time. Um, we're not we all got blinders on when it comes down to suggestions from from you. Um, you know how the business is run, how field service is taken care of. You know all the parts to make a good pinball company is really a lot of feedback from from you, and and that's important to us. So you know anything uh, that comes up that you, you guys want to talk about or throw out there. Just feel free to do that. Shoot us an email, give us a call, however it works out. And, uh, you know, we will definitely look into it, see what we can do about it. Uh, bottom line is, you're important to us. So, uh, it doesn't, everything else around it doesn't really matter. It's it's the end user, the end customer, you guys, that, that get us ready for the next one and support what we're doing. So, you know, hats off to you guys. For being there for us um, uh, up until now. Use the shooter to um, what else can we cover? Uh, just kind of thinking how how this came together, and we are where we are. There's a lot of naysayers early on. Um, you know, we had put it out there that we were going to get to Texas, and that that little window, and a lot of people said that's not going to happen. And I think that's what drove us um, even harder to say, well, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. And, and, we, and, it, and it did. So we'll, we'll hang our hat on that. And, you know, we're in production now, obviously. Uh, you know, games what are you ship. For? Uh, back orders, everything have been covered. Um, our distributors were just kind of knocking at their doors a little more often. Say, you know, how many you need, when you need them. Um, you know, we started to do some add-ons to the game. Um, one thing that, that we started 
early on was uh, the one game, one price, uh, um, you know, type of plan moving forward as a new company. Uh, to have all the different levels of each game, there's all that much more time and effort that needs to go into a, a final product when you have, you know, three levels of a game. Use the shooter uh, to start. We didn't have, we, you know, even to this day, we don't really have the staff that can do three, uh, you know, three different rule sets or three different play fields or three different art packages. So, so we wanted to pin that down as a one price, one game, one price, um, as far as us moving forward. As it started to come together, um, I wasn't a big blade guy from the side in the interior art. Uh, I just come from a time, you know, when that interior art wasn't a big deal. Um, it just was something out there. That, it's kind of like when I was a kid and everybody had cars and you would get, you know, put a new exhaust system on it or some headers and a, and a you know, a, a Holly four barrel or whatever and you kind of work with your car and trick it up and make it yours. Um, that's what people do to pinballs these days. So when I talked to Jeff Bush, our artist, and said, you know, one of the things about blades is they're usually done by a different artist that did the art package for the game because there's you know, other different companies that do them and they try to match them and try to make it look right, but it always looks a little different than the art package. So when I talked to Jeff about doing this and gave him the sizes to work with, and just said, you know, go nuts on the blades and put in images and things that you couldn't fit or put in the play field or other things that you wanted to get in the play field that you couldn't and put some fun stuff in there. And when we did get the blades in and pop them on the game, I was all in. So you know, to have the artist do the artist that did the package do the blades, that's that's our that's a rule of ours. And on game two, we're hoping to, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to fit those into the package of the game without having it being an add-on. So that's something that we're working on. It's all little material at that point. So <clears throat> we're working on that to try to hit that number and still fit in what we can. Uh, there's a shaker motor kit now that's available. There's a knocker kit that's available. Uh, we came up with our own um, Glare proof glass, uh, we call it a visit glass. Um, it makes a huge difference. So, we do have the, that in stock. It's a nice add on, not, and it's for any standard body game. Um, so, we have those available. You have to call in and see what kind of price you can get for them. But, um, you know, that's available too. Um, we have been working on a topper. We know that there's a couple toppers out there now that you can get aftermarket. Uh, we have been working on one for this game, we're working on one for our second game. So we will, we're trying to have a topper available per model uh, before it hits the street. So, so it's available, you guys, it's kind of like an a la carte now. So you can order the game through your distributor, say, hey, give me blades and magic glass and a shaker motor, and they'll come up with, you know, some type of a deal to, to get them put in in the factory, as opposed to you guys having to do it yourself. You know, putting blades on a game, you got to pull the play field to do it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that. You got a $7,000, you know, piece that you just bought, and you got to pull the play field out to put these blades on. So, you know, we, we want to make that available um, coming out of the factory if and when possible. That's that's how we, we want to do it. So it's kind of like a a la carte. You can talk to distribution and say, I want to get it with this, this, and this on it. Check our website, what's available and we can custom build that game for you uh, before it leaves the factory. Um, that's about all I got about me. I just wanted to kind of introduce myself to you guys. Um, any questions from anybody here that you want to hit on the stuff that I can answer? If you got any questions about you know, who I am or whatever that I can answer, we can do that right now. Um, what's been running up there was um, just a uh, kind of a montage of, of things that have been going on at the factory. Um, the one thing 
that I did have um, this. So I have a bunch of games, just a bunch of uh, images of games that I have that I've worked on that I can kind of just run through uh, for you guys. Uh, games that, that I had something to do with the layout. If we can get this to come up, which would be nice. My computer doesn't like to work in Canada. So, so that's Apollo. And again, the big deal on Apollo was the 13 ball multi ball play. It's a good shooting game. Um, I enjoy it all the time. People come to my house and shoot it. They, they're amazed at the 13 ball, multi ball, and it's been fun. Just some images of it that I picked up over time. If you look right here, I don't know how closely you can see this, this area here. I could get bigger with it if I have to, but that was the first time that uh, my name got put on a back glass. Um, Walser Backwards comes out Rec Lab, and Rec Lab just kind of worked with the space theme and since uh, Tom Hanks didn't want his image on the back glass, we had to pop in this guy with the, uh, you know, look it into his visor where you could see the, the earth in his visor, which actually that was a pinball, which was pretty cool, but licensors didn't go for that one. But uh, he, he got to be named the Rec Lab. That was the first time that my name got to get out of back glass. That's exciting for me. You know, a lot going on in the game, as you can see. It was a fun game to put together. It was back in the day when you could really add a lot and the build material wasn't gigantic like it is these days. One thing that made it better for build material then was we would do releases of, you know, 2,500 or 5,000 at a time. That's how the market worked. Now you're releasing, you know, 500, 250s, 500, maybe 1,000, but, uh, it kind of it kind of plays with those numbers a little bit when you go down in quantities. Some Apollo stuff. There's Baywatch. That's the really the first one that I did the mechanical layout of. Got to get crazy with wire ramps. They're running all over the place here. Kind of a mouse trap type of thing. It's kind of fun. Baywatch was obviously huge back then. Hasselhoff was like Elvis out in uh, Austria, I think, at the time. Godzilla was a fun game. Uh, it was a game we tried to do at a less cost, but it didn't work out that way. There's not a lot on the game, uh, except one big, gigantic, green plastic ramp. And if you guys ever seen it, that, that ramp it goes back here and all, all the way around. It's one piece that drops down, and that was done. Uh, the drawing for that that came off the AutoCAD, we had a QC guy that wanted a drawing. I said, I don't think you want this drawing. And he said, no, I, I need a drawing. So we printed it out. It was 36 inches wide by, I think, 10 feet because of all the different views to make this thing happen. He ended up pinning it up on the wall in his office and it stayed there for his like wallpaper. It was, it was the biggest drawing that I remember printing back in, back then. And it was just a matter of, you know, a big Godzilla head coming out with the hand crushing a the building. There wasn't a lot going on there, but it was, turned out to be a pretty good uh, shooting game. Uh, High Roller Casino was one that uh, another designer had left and I took it over and kind of relayed it out in some areas. Uh, to kind of fit what we were doing at the time. Hobbit was when I was over at uh, Jersey Jet because I spent a couple years um, at Jersey Jet. I actually did Wizard of Oz as their first game and then I did the layout for Hobbit. Um, the game was pretty close to production at the time, but when I left, um, there was a couple of changes done to the play field and it is what it is today. But mostly the layout, uh, stay the same. There's just some shots of, uh, there's the white wood, uh, even before smog was put in. We had different ideas for smog when I was there that kind of changed into what it is today. There's Hobbit and Pan with your eyes. There's a, it's a shot of the play field printed. 
some earlier hard work. Uh, this is just kind of overlay of what was going on with the artwork at the time. There we are shooting, uh, shooting the white wood, wondering how this shot's going to work or whatever I had in my mind at that point. But that was a fun game to do. Like you see, that's, that's really early white wood right there. Another couple of shots of how the artwork evolved. This was a game I did uh, over at Sega, which was Data East Sega Stern, same company, different name. This was just a one-off of a, of a golf game in uh, basically in a, uh, a redemption cabinet. Didn't go anywhere, but kind of fun to do. This was the last game I, I laid out um, at Stern uh, with Simpsons Pinball Party. Uh, when I left, it was probably 90, 95% done. There's a couple things that obviously, you know, that, that changed from the original, not where it was, but the back that went in there. Uh, super fun game to do, working with Keith Johnson on that. I mean, and you guys know how deep and crazy those rules are in that game. So it kind of put, you know, Keith on the map in a big way on, uh, on what he did with the rule set. I think that's the original Simpsons which is kind of a wild thing where I, when I started there, Simpsons was on the line. And when I left there, uh, Simpsons was ready to go at the second one, the, the pinball party. You seem to be sitting here for a month of Sundays. Uh, let's see. South Park, fun, fun game to do. Uh, got, to, got to meet the guys that do this uh, out in New York. Uh, it was really fun to meet them. South Park's a, you know, back in the, you know, that day, it was a, a simpler game, uh, simpler rules, but a, a good shooter and a lot of fun. A funny game to play. In fact, I have a South Park, an Apollo 13, and a Space Jam. Uh, it's the only three I have left after two divorces. So, <laughs> they all kind of know what that means. Yeah, that's a good thing. What are you waiting for? <laughs> But it's kind of a first game out there, and it'll probably never happen again. We got a toilet and a piece of poop on the game. It's kind of a, we looked at that. We actually made brown inserts. That was, the supplier was like, you want what? Just a brown insert, you know, translucent brown. Is that a color you have? And, uh, and he pulled it off, I don't know. Uh, Space Jam, blast to do that game. Uh, you know, the shot up here is jumps and grabs on a magnet and slams it, so it's got a nice feel to it as, make, as far as making baskets. I don't know if anybody, you know, if you guys have played it before, it's kind of a fun shooter. Uh, I did all the mechs on that game. That's one of the games that I was able to, you know, we, under time frames, I did all the mechs and shots and everything on that game. Got to meet Michael Jordan, crazy. Went to one of his charities and uh, met uh, Patrick Ewing, who is an oak tree, gigantic man with gigantic hands. I think his hands covered half of, half of my arm when I shook his hand. He's a big man. Uh, Starship Troopers. Uh, a couple people really enjoy this that you know come to me and say, man, that's like my favorite game. Um, I've really had, we really had a lot of fun putting this one together. There's one on the floor out there that plays pretty good. Uh, Striker Extreme, um, that was a game that had a different title and got changed to a soccer game when Gary said, we need a soccer game, um, and then it got kind of cut short. It didn't really do that well as the soccer game or the sales overseas weren't as high as we expected. And then we went off and, and made a couple different versions of it, turned it into, you know, U.S. football type of thing. We did uh, specials for, you know, the Bears, Broncos, 49ers. Uh, when the markets wanted some, and we uh, individualized that for our distri distribution. Star Wars Trilogy, another real fun game to do. I think that year is when I did Star Wars Trilogy, and it 
might have been um, Starship Troopers or Space Jam, something, two games that year, uh, back to back, which was, you know, took a lot of time, a lot of work to get that done. We changed the head back then, we went to the curved head. You'll see a couple of them out on the floor. Wizard of Oz, loved doing it. Loved having a wide body format to work with. Uh, fun, fun game to do. Uh, really one of my favorite layouts. That's got a lot going on. Uh, three three play fields, the whole nine yards. We we pulled all you know, pulled all the stops on that line. Not just put in a 27 inch monitor, RGB LED lighting, but gave you three play fields. It was a monster. And for a first one out of box for a, a new company. That was a big build to get right. And let's see what else we got. That's pretty much it. I just had a few of them up here. That was it. So that's that. Okay. Yeah, we got uh, we only got 15 minutes left, so we'll we'll take it from here. We don't need to show much more. Um, anybody got any questions? Anything you kind of want to talk about? Something you've seen out there? Or something you just want to get off your chest right now? That's uh, kind of open, open for questions. Yes. No, it was a. There was nothing. The design came from the from the name. So, and that's the best way to design is to have a theme, and then design that game around that theme. Um, you could take it. You know, I have a couple of layouts that you could probably plug a theme into. Um, but this one was. We tried to keep a ramp that was tooled, and we ended up changing it anyway. But um, yeah, the, the layout was done specifically for, for this and specifically for a first game. We didn't want to do, you know, what I saw at, at uh, JJP with the startup with Wizard of Oz as being such a big game, it's that much harder to get it right and get it built. So we tried to not necessarily dumb it down, but make a game that um, had enough going on, but it wasn't a killer when it went to manufacturing. And you can see because we, we did the turnaround, got to Texas, and then we shipped. And at Texas, I said we'd be shipping by the end of 2017, and we did. We actually shipped three games on December 30th. So we didn't BS anybody and say, well, maybe it's in another three months, or maybe. So we did start shipping, and then we you know, started shipping uh, uh, full time a couple months after that as we got the line run. So, Tom. All right, you know what? Just for you, Tom. I think a lot of people, a lot of people pick up, picked up on what we were doing for Game Two because it's a non-licensed thing. And what happens is, um, and I'm probably going to open a can of worms for everybody here, but uh, or you probably all know this. As far as a trademark goes, that's open. That's public domain. So. If you do a licensed product, that remains between you and the licensor until you want to say something or, or you want to announce it. Um, one thing that we didn't think of, or just because we were in such a frantic mode to get things done, uh, when you trademark, um, everybody knows it. So, you know, the Houdini trademark, they knew, everybody knew. Um, or could know that that's the next game we were doing. Um, so the trademark, uh, when we trademarked our game two, which for people here that don't know, we're doing an Oktoberfest game. So when that got out early on, 
we kind of understood that, you know, we, we got to watch what we do as far as trademarks go. Maybe we need to wait a little bit or try to trademark three or four or five things at a time so we can get some confusion going out out there because it kind of, you know, let the cat out of the bag a lot sooner than I expected it to. But that's, that's our game that we're working on moving forward. And um, hold on, I want to pull up one without revealing the world. Hold on. We're calling a game, it's Oktoberfest Pitball on Tap. Um, one thing we want to do um, with the theme, um, we don't want to turn it into this crazy drinking game without any family ties to it at all. Um, it's hard for some of us to convince the wife, maybe, or whatever, to buy a game that's going to be all about drinking beer. Um, and, you know, kind of partying and drinking beer, or whatever. So there are aspects of this game that are definitely family friendly too. Um, we have modes in the game that will be, you know, kind of drinking modes and chugging modes, things like that. But it's not, it, it's not way out there that it's you know, a complete adult themed game. Um, you know, being Oktoberfest, if, if you look into it um, and what it is, you know, it's a big family thing too. So it's gigantic around the world. And by adding pitbull on tap to it, we give it some legs to, it doesn't have to be just in October that you have Oktoberfest. Um, it could be at any, you know, it's, it's, it's year round, it's whatever it is. It fits right in any of your uh, collections, your, you know, the barcades, all of this should work well, um, as far as, as we know, or we hope. Uh, I'm gonna switch to another picture real quick. up a couple of a couple of pictures of the play field and as you can see here uh, we got a little bit of rampage going on on the game um, I think I believe um, the first time you see this game and shoot this game uh, you're gonna I think it's gonna be really well received I really got a lot going on so we bumped up Houdini to we know how to build Houdini, so now it's time to build something a little bit bigger and a little bit better. Um, not saying that Houdini's not good, just saying that we need to bump each game if we can, and that's kind of our plan. So, you know, as you can see here, we got you know, we, we got ramps going all over the place, and I'm not giving you anything to really say. Oh, I can figure out what's going on there, but. Um, there's shots we've got. We've got um, shots that change into different shots. We have uh, a wire form ramp that I don't think well has never been done on a production pinball before. Uh, we've got a ramp on there that once you see it, um, you're gonna look at it and think, I don't know if you could even shoot that, and you can shoot it. So it's uh, it's got a lot of cool stuff going on that I think you guys will be happy with once you see it. And like I said. We're, we're on the fast track to try to get a couple, three, whatever we can, maybe more if we can, to, uh, to, uh, to Expo in October. So that's what we're planning to do on unveil there. Let's see, I'll pull up one more one. Oh, by the way, so um, while I'm doing this, um, this is Nermo Vasani. Um, he's going to be working uh, our marketing and sales side. Uh, fresh out of school, 
learn a lot about the industry. Uh, I'm sure he's wanting to pick people's brains here and just get some ideas on how this industry works and he's in that mode. So uh, I'll give it over to Normal for a minute and I'll pull up another couple pictures and I'll pop them up there. Well, unfortunately we're running kind of tight on time. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen kind of some of the prizes that I have laid out. Uh, since we won't get a chance to do all that right now, what I will do is um, I'll be hanging around the machine. This machine will be out over there, um, close to the main entrance. And so I'll be kind of hanging around that machine and uh, I'll be talking to you guys. And so come over, talk to me. If you get a decent score, I'll give you one of the prizes of your choice. How does that sound? I was one of the main characters in the game. Um, funny fat guy that's gonna make this game come together as far as characters go. So he's our guy. Um, he's our uh, he's our Oktoberfest guy. And uh, you know, it, without Otto, uh, this game doesn't doesn't happen. So um, you know, I'd love to show you guys a lot more, uh, but you know. I'm on the edge of even showing this, just because, just because, you know, I, 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 like I said, we, a part of our company is if, you know, if we say it, we, we're going to do it, and, you know, I'm now saying it, so it is Oktoberfest, um, pinball on tap, it's going to happen, um, with maybe some of that luck and some of that sprinkle stardust that happened to make this happen. Um, we're hoping to make that same thing happen. Um, you know, one of the things with our, our smaller engineering group is that getting Houdini on the line and getting good games shipped early on, I spent, you know, a couple of months out there. Um, you know, a couple guys in engineering, we were at every game, we signed off on every game before it went out. And it, and it paid off for us because the build quality I'm not saying that it was me building them, but I was making sure that how it was supposed to be built was what was going in the box. And that kind of ate up time on developing game two. And I'll put that right out there. And that was a decision that had to be made. I mean, you know, we had the better insight on what the game should be and how it should go. And we had to be there to do that. So that's probably why there was this Definitely, that is why there was this gap that said, in the back of my head, I had this little guy banging on my head saying, you got to get out of game two, you got to get out of game two, but we're trying to ship quality. And until we got the right people in and trained and could do what we did uh, to sign off on games, um, now that's taken care of. We got a guy at the end of the line that you know he, he knows everything there is inside or out about that game and anything he sees is out of the ordinary or something's wrong, you know, he puts a stop to it, gets one of us, and, you know, we, we rectify it before it goes in the box. Nobody's pushing games out. Um, and until, even to this day, we're not just purposely pushing games out. We have to ship quality, and when we do have problems, we have to have a service that's going to take care of it. So, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, one thing that's been really nice is some guys, I had a conversation with a couple of guys, Said, you know, I know the field service guy from this company, and I definitely know the field service guy from this company, and I know this guy pretty good too from this company, but I don't even know who your service guy is. Bam. You know, that's a big old fist pump, and, you know, thank you. Without saying, you know, without saying, he's saying that he got himself a good game. You know, so and that's a good thing for us. Uh, so yeah, I'm just gonna put this back up there as we finish this thing off. And I probably talked too much and too long. We really never got into the game we're playing, but um, you know, we'll be out in the booth all day. You guys come on out. Definitely want to shoot a game with me or with any of us. Um, I, I can take some. We'll take some people out and, and, and do that. And we've got some pretty cool things that. They cut up some play fields and framed them, uh, framed the cutouts. They're pretty cool little things for your game rooms. Um, 
that you know I, I haven't seen out there. We got a few T-shirts um, of our Slingshot Girls um, on Houdini, so we got those to give away. Uh, this one's extra cool. It's the whole Houdini uh, logo from the playfield. So yeah, it is a little crooked. We'll have QC check that before we ship it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, come you know come over to the booth. Let's uh, let's have a great day together. Shoot Houdini, get to know it. Hopefully you guys got one or are gonna order one. Put it in your game room. I, I stand by the game. It's a good, it's a really fun game to play. I know we hear a lot about tight shots, but I'll tell you what, the shots are makeable. And once you figure it out and you go out to a game that has bigger shots, you're gonna be hitting those all day. You'll come back here and then, you know you'll be a, a wizard on this one. So. It's nice to put a couple shots. Let's challenge our players. I mean, that's in my head all the time. But uh, on this game in particular, it's a game that starts multi-ball. It's a shot that starts multi-ball. You lock balls there. Backhand, if you guys shoot the game, remember you got a backhand, and that backhand's pretty solid going to that shot. So um, I hope you all enjoy the game. I hope you all enjoy just kind of talking here. Um, I know the questions were not that many, which is good. Um, I guess I covered base as well. And, you know, come out and talk to us and let's have some fun the rest of the show. And definitely thanks for coming out. Uh, that's the guy that does it right there. And, and Tommy is here too. Yeah, that's for you, Tommy. By the way, huge shout out to Tommy for supplying us with pizza. That was great. Yeah, so uh, thank you guys so much, and um, I think they forgot also, there's a box, it's like this big, and it's full of uh, American pinball shirts, and it's just sitting near the booth there, so there's got to be a hundred shirts in there, so definitely hang out with these guys, they're going to be giving them out all day, and uh, please stick around, we've got Mike Kalinowski uh, from Holkin, he's coming up next, he's going to talk about Thunderbirds and a lot of other things. Uh, so yeah, uh, take a quick break and then uh, come on back and uh, let's have some fun. Thank you.